Once more, we take you with us on a journey of exploration. Wheels across the Andes, from the Pacific coast of Ecuador, across the high backbone of South America, to the sky-high waters of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, and the survivors of an ancient civilization in historic Peru. Much of our journey is through the most mountainous country in the world. Much of it is good road, superbly engineered and safe. Much is not good. After rainstorms, it is almost impassable. Sometimes, indeed, a riverbed is better than the road. Now we are on our way toward the jungle. In a few hours, we shall be down into timbered country, into green and moist valleys and misty lowlands. We plan to visit an amazing tribe of jungle Indians, the Colorados, who live deep in the rainforest. We have left all roads behind us. Against all advice, my son David boasts that if I will let him take his time, he will drive into the Colorado country. Well, here he is, taking his time and not a bit discouraged. He may have slowed down a bit, but he's still moving. Here is our first Colorado Indian, obviously on his way to the little town we have just left. The world over, the American cigarette is a symbol of goodwill and friendship, an easy introduction. Now let me explain this fellow's appearance. That's not a hat or a helmet on his head, it's his own hair, plastered down with a sticky red coloring matter called achiote. Colorado means red, and Achiot makes the Colorados red. His hands are not dirty, they dyed blue. He's not particularly dressed up. This is the everyday costume of a Colorado. You can see that his teeth also are dyed black. I try to make him show us his dental decorations a little more clearly, but he seems to be both high strung and ticklish. Here are a father and son whose nerves are under better control. Hippolyte and Ramon are their names. Hippolyte, who speaks a few words of Spanish, will be a valuable friend and advisor during our stay with the Colorados. He is greatly impressed by the Dodge Power Wagon, but he says it's useless to try to push on with the cars. We have a broad river to cross and must go on foot. He promises to meet us with horses on the other side of the river. To impress Hippolyte still further, I try to make him listen and talk over the radio telephone which provides communication with our base camp. But he doesn't get the idea at all, and it's beyond my abilities to explain it to him in his native language. What he and Ramon want is a fast ride in the power wagon, and this they get. So we proceed on foot through the jungle of our childhood dreams. Gorgeously colorful, steamy and mysterious, smelling like a hothouse, alive with a million sounds of birds and insects. Out of the tangle of undergrowth through which we cut our way, trees rise to what seems a fantastic height above us. We come to the river which Hippolyte said we would have to cross. He told us there would be a bridge. At dusk, we find the bridge, an insecure contraption of steel cable and tree branches. The broad river rushing over its rocky bed, the threatening jungle on either side, the sky heavy with the darkening clouds of an approaching storm, this is one of the most memorable scenes in all my experience. The next morning, we find Hippolyte faithful to his promise with our horses. And with him are his wife, Philomena, and his daughter, Rosita. This is the way in which long years ago, travelers and explorers, missionaries and traders, 
made journeys sometimes of many weeks through the hot and unhealthy jungle. Personally, I'm more at home at the wheel of a car, and I'm glad that I waited to be born until the age of the automobile. When we have set up camp, the mere routine of peeling potatoes fills the Colorados with amazement. They watch our simplest activities with endless curiosity. A source of never to be forgotten wonder is one of our cameras. On the ground glass focusing screen, they see the whole camp alive and upside down. Meanwhile, Ippolit's people in their turn are demonstrating for us the manner of the Colorado's daily life. I am fascinated by these Indians of unknown origin and history, of whom there are said to be less than 1,000 left. They are a sturdy and independent people who clearly do not wish to adopt any other tribe's dress or way of living. Their faces reflect a strong individuality, in sharp contrast to other Indian tribes of this region. They are far indeed from being primitives, they have their own arts and crafts, know how to spin, dye, and weave wool, and make their own garments. The Colorados build simple but ingenious and efficient presses to squeeze out the juice of the sugar cane, which they cultivate in jungle clearings. This, like all their activities, is a family affair. With the leaves removed, the sugar cane stalks are fed one by one between the rollers of the machine. Philomena guides them while it takes all the strength of Hippolyte and Ramon to turn the rollers against the heavy pressure. In this machine, there is not a nail or a piece of metal, but it does its work. The tough fibrous cane is crushed. A simple banana leaf with a hole through the center collects the sweet solution to fill the homemade earthenware jar. People with so much ingenuity and skill could easily develop a more complex way of life along the lines of what we call progress. But the Colorados do not seem to wish to do so. They seem to prefer to go their own unsophisticated way. Why not? The jungle gives them all they need. Presently, visitors arrive for a fiesta to celebrate our coming. Colorados are ever full of surprises. The musical instrument they carry is what they call a marimba, but I recognize it immediately as a Central African xylophone. Polidor, the witch doctor, is another of our good friends. He shows us the achiote seeds and how easy it is to obtain from them the red dye with which the Indians paint their faces and their bodies. Using the mirror we gave him, he applies a new coat of paint. And next he shows us how to insert a matchstick into the hole which every Colorado has on the tip of his nose. Everyone is busy dressing up. The blue dye also comes from a plant and is apparently especially favored by the women. But it's the red achiote dye which gets into everything, even the puppy dogs. Courtesy demands that the leader of the expedition should also be decorated. Unfortunately, the red paint caused a painful irritation, and it took a week for the blue stripes to wear off. We have set up sound recording equipment to record the playing of the marimba. I am intrigued by this instrument, born in the depths of the Congo in Africa, which was carried centuries ago to the west coast of Ecuador, and which has now penetrated unchanged so far into this alien jungle. The Colorados have watched us work without a flicker of understanding, but now we are playing back to them the recording we have just made. Music which they just heard being played is now coming out of this box and it seems to them to be a wondrous deed of gods or demons. It is the older people who look like children among the Colorados, and the children like our little Rosita, who look as the adults should. Meanwhile, David has made good his boast and triumphantly brings the power wagon all the way into camp. He has brought with him wonders which the jungle children have never seen. They are overcome with shyness.
some of the youngsters happily experiment with the sweets and toys. The little girls shyly play with a doll, a blue-eyed doll made in Sweden the only doll I could find in the city of Quito. Back on the road again, a road boldly cut out of the rock, out of the walls of ravines and canyons. We are crossing one of the two main chains of the Andes, the Cordillera Negra, the Black Cordillera. climbed at last above the highest rail point to bleak summits with pockets of snow. Finally, just under the snow line, we reach the top of the pass itself. A breathtaking panorama of snow-capped mountains is now before us, the Cordillera Blanca, or White Cordillera. As we descend again to the valley of Huaylas, we get nearer and nearer to the Peruvian giants of the Andes. Most spectacular of all, Huascaran, 22,000 feet high. Evening falls, the twilight glow slowly invades the great snow peaks. A few days later, we start out to climb a mountain, one of the many minor peaks around us. It is unnamed on the maps and probably still unclimbed. We have all had bad cases of soroche, mountain sickness, since we reached these unusual altitudes. Some people suffer so distressingly from soroche that they cannot remain at all in these high valleys of the Andes. Most travelers get very sick for a few days and then gradually adapt themselves. This has been the case with us. The present outing is to celebrate our recovery as well as to serve as training for the future. Our first day has been good. But now the weather clearly is spoiling. By the time we have made camp, snow is falling and the prospect is gloomy for tomorrow. Next morning, snow is still falling. It is bitterly cold, although we are within a few miles of the equator. Coffee and hot oatmeal for breakfast. We start off with little hope of a clearing of the fog. But we have climbed only a few hundred feet when the clouds lift. The edge of the glacier, clear ice, deep blue, treacherous under a fresh layer of snow, broken with many glittering crevasses and caves, and pools of milky blue water. The crossing of the glacier requires the utmost caution. Almost on the slope, with the top in clear sight, we have our only near accident. Half an hour later, the last steps are cut. The last few feet are covered. And the 
the top is reached. We fly a great deal on this trip. Everyone does in South America, most air-minded of continents. Sometimes for hours we zoom low over the immense, unbroken, haunting, frightening, green hell of the Amazon jungle. And again with oxygen, we soar at 18, 20, or 24,000 feet over the Andes. Always when we fly over near the great icy peaks, I look for one thing. Just under the snow line, the clearly marked pathways, mysterious and fascinating to me. Who made these paths? No Indians of today live that high, no wild animals. These worn pathways at the edge of the snow are a riddle which I long to solve. On the high plateaus of Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina, Yamas carry loads at 16,000 feet and more. Herds of alpacas supply wool. Here, wild vicernas roam, seldom seen. But we had luck one morning and got these. These animals, relatives of the camel, are built for altitude. Their lungs and hearts are far larger, their blood more abundant, and far richer in red cells than that of most animals. A little tame vicuna was brought to us one day, a graceful and delicate thing, and for a while it was the expedition's mascot. That it was especially constructed to live at high altitudes proved not to handicap it in the least when later we brought it to sea level. It is today living happily with some of our good friends in Lima. In the Peruvian capital, I found the government concerned with the same problem which intrigued me, that of adaptation to life at high altitudes. I found that Peruvian doctors had done pioneer work in research in this field. I told them of some of the things that had most astonished me. Of the spirited game of association football, which I had seen played by Indian mine workers on a sodden field at an altitude of nearly 16,000 feet. I could scarcely drag myself around in the thin air. And yet after a lively game, the players had shown no sign of strain. The doctors told me those mountain Indians, like the Yama and Vicuna, have enormously enlarged lungs, more blood, and blood far richer in red cells than the Indians of the plains. We have traveled the boundary of Peru to Lake Titicaca. It is not only the largest lake in South America, but it is by far the highest navigable lake in the world with an altitude of 12,644 feet. Imagine a lake 140 miles long and 69 miles wide on top of Pikes Peak. To live comfortably around this beautiful lake, you must take care to be born and raised here, for only in this way can you grow the necessary Superman lungs and blood supply. The city of La Paz, the highest city in the world. Denver boasts of being a mile high. La Paz is almost three miles above sea level. In La Paz, they have enough energy to have bullfights, but they are comedy bullfights. I suppose the bulls also have to be raised here to feel equal to this clowning. See that again. Believe it or not, to get to the La Paz airport, you climb 1,000 feet above the city. La Paz airport is the most beautiful I know anywhere, with a backdrop of great mountains. It is the highest commercial airport in the world with an elevation of 14,500 feet. To land and to take off loaded planes in this thin air is not easy, but Panagra's pilots have been doing it daily for many years. We take off with a government medical mission to a place where I'll have a chance to observe research on high altitudes. Thank you. 
Hundreds of Indians from the mountains and from plains have had certain characteristics systematically measured and recorded. Here a technician measures the lung capacity of a typical Indian from Titicaca. Over five liters, where the average among the Indians of the lowlands would be scarcely three. A group is being put through a measured amount of physical work, two minutes by stopwatch of breaking up hard ground. Immediately after measured exertion, measurement of pulse for comparison with blood pressure and pulse under conditions of rest. At the request of North American doctors, we make sound recordings of the beating of the heart. We have also been asked for recordings made after extreme exertion. This is the finish of a quarter mile race at 14,000 feet. After this race, blood pressure is almost what would be normal at sea level. A few days later, we have reached a point on the Pan American Highway, which I have been impatiently awaiting. Here a road branches off into the mountains. I have convinced myself by many hours of study of maps of Asia and of North and South America, that the end of this road is the highest point in the world which can be reached by road. We have borrowed oxygen masks and made up our minds to establish with the power wagon a world record, the altitude record for automobiles. At the end of the road, we pause for final adjustment of the carburetor. Our altimeter, checked by radio, confirms the figure given on the maps. The end of the road is at 17,000 feet. Now we leave the road to climb further. We have set our hearts on reaching an altitude of 18,000 feet. The loose, slippery slope is far from a good surface. We have no special gasoline for this grueling test. The patches of snow throw us off every few yards. Given a road, we could sail right up. Fifty minutes after leaving the end of the road, the needle of the altimeter touches 18,000. It is very decidedly cold up here and we do not linger. It takes us less than 50 minutes to come down again. The region of Cuzco was the center of the old Inca civilization which flourished amazingly in Peru before the coming of the Spaniards. To this day, there lives around Cuzco an Indian population full of character and color with a heritage of traditions dating back to the days of the Incas before the Spanish conquest and Christianization. Pagan and Christian traditions are inextricably mixed. The Indians are deeply religious. Their religion is associated with all their activities. We are attending the yearly fiesta, Saints' Day, here on the hacienda of an old country estate. Gaiety and dancing will continue for several days, but the fiesta begins with prayers to the Virgin and to the saints. Absorbed in prayer, rarely conscious of the camera, the Indians present a wonderful variety of types, of costumes, and of emotions. It would be difficult not to be moved by the stillness and the intensity of this scene of devotion. The fiesta will begin, this is over. With a small hand camera, we begin to look for candid shots. A gossiping girl with thick black braids. Vividly decorated ponchos and hats, characteristic of this region. The cattle buyer for the farm. And his wife, both of them in their Sunday best. And a farmer's wife with a good-humored, weather-beaten face. Music, costumes, and dances, all are old and traditional. The meaning of many of these dances is lost in antiquity. 
I tried vainly to get an explanation of this one, suggestive, obviously, of whipping. The different masks are readily identified by the spectators. These rounded faces, we are told, represent Indians. This group with its narrow faces, dapper blonde mustaches, pointed noses and little beards represent the Spaniards, the conquerors. These creatures with the sheepskin headdresses are, it seems, the wild beasts of the jungle. We've also been told that the woolen mask on the face and the black cross identify the inquisitors. So you can take your choice. But about this group, there can be no doubt. These are the lawyers with their high hats, their books, their inquisitive noses, which seem to be always unhappily covered with warts, and their mannerisms. Traditional and much enjoyed caricature of the legal profession. Their books are all important and constantly consulted. Equally indispensable are their noses necessary to the turning of the pages. This lawyer is putting the young Indian kneeling before him through some solemn initiation. This is the direct way to make knowledge penetrate the human mind. We see now why this poor Indian looked somewhat apprehensive, but the effect does not as yet appear to be sufficient, so let's give him another treatment for good measure. For our last chapter, we will cross the Peruvian border into Bolivia to see a strange religious pageant, a Diablada, the dance of the devils. The colorful costumes, the intricate symbolism of this age-old ceremonial dance are extremely interesting to the traveler who's fortunate enough to be a spectator, but it's difficult for even the trained archeologist to follow the thread of the story. Preceded by a mysterious infant, an archangel and the chief of the devils gamble in, obviously on the best of terms, followed by sin and temptation and a wonderful retinue of lesser devils. These masks are among the most beautiful and imaginative in the world. I have never seen anywhere such genius for the grotesque, such vivid coloring. This spectacular pageantry provides a dramatic conclusion to our adventurous journey on wheels across the Andes.